Hello. Welcome to TSC Talks, the podcast inspired by the condition known as tuberous sclerosis complex, which causes benign tumors to grow in all the major organs of the body. This podcast is for those directly affected, parents, caregivers, anyone who's ever struggled to make sense of unimaginable circumstances and find a way. My name is Jill Woodworth and I am your host. Buckle up, we're going for a ride outside the box, off the grid, down many a rabbit hole and back as we wrangle a way to case manage and stay sane. Talk about it, compare notes, find the experts, pick their brains. No magic bullet, but we are not alone. Hello, thank you so much for tuning in. Up next on the podcast is John Workman. I was just recording this and getting really deep into the weeds because John has a phenomenal resume covering a lot of different industries. So I was practically, you know, doing a whole nother podcast outlining it. So I'm just going to give you the highlights. John is the VP for the American Cannabis Company based out of Denver, Colorado. He works for them as their VP of business development for their division, American Hemp Services. As well, he works with applicants looking to get into medical marijuana or adult use uh, marijuana space. The Farm Bill, he mentions, opened up markets for cultivations pretty much nationwide. So he's working on the hemp side as well. He is a farmer. He's from Arkansas, grew up on a large farm and understands the evolution of crops. Great experience to bring into the hemp industry. However, he moved to Southern California about two and a half decades ago and worked in the financial industries, ended up doing really well, but he had a snowboarding accident where he broke a rib and found out he had multiple myeloma, was given three years to live. Obviously, he he lived, and he had another, He had, this process of the cancer was just extremely intense, and he overcame it, and I'm not going to tell you he used can, cannabis to cure it. However, he did use cannabis to increase his appetite and help him recover, so that's part of his story as well, but he came out of the this experience and the cannabis or got into the cannabis industry, the hemp industry in his in his back in his hometown. So hopefully I've hit some of the highlights. It's a great episode for those interested in learning more about the hemp hemp industry. Gives a lot of insight on the marijuana industry and vision for the future. Just a rich episode with a guy that's got a lot of knowledge and experience. So I'm going to stop talking. You can listen to John. Thanks again, John, for being on the podcast and take it away. Thanks for doing this. Sure. My pleasure. So, well, uh, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm glad to do these. This is, this is good stuff. Good, good. So, um, as you know, I'm doing this podcast and I'm trying to talk to people in the industry about their experiences and get some, you know, insight for the project that we're working on to f- develop a guidebook for people to, particularly with kids or, you know, the, or themselves that want to use CBD or mm-hmm. cannabinoid medicine to reduce the number of pharmaceuticals they're on and improve health. You know, I think personally, I've had a really positive experience and I, I'm sure I'm going to hear, hear from you as well. And I yeah. just, I have kids that are on tons of pharmaceuticals and I'm just tired of it. So sure. I just am thrilled to hear from you. So why don't you tell me a little bit about, you know, what you're doing right now and your life thus far, and we'll just kind of go with it. Right. Well, I currently I'm, uh, I'm a vice president for American cannabis company uh, based out of Denver, Colorado. I work for them as their vice president of, Hemp business development for their division, uh, American Hemp Services. I've been working in in the space for about three uh, every day. Uh, it's not, it is my day, it is my day job, and uh, uh, in in doing so, I work with uh, applicants that are looking to get into the uh, uh, to the medical marijuana or the adult use marijuana space, as well as the 2018 Farm Bill uh, opened up the markets for the hemp cultivation pretty much uh, nationwide. Now I'm working more in, in the hemp side as well. That being said, prior to that, 
I've been a farmer all my life. I'm from the southeast part of Arkansas, and our family is a, a row crop operation there that goes back four generations. Wow. Uh, and uh, we farm uh, corn, rice, soybeans, wheat, and we're large cotton farmer up until a few years ago when uh, the, you know, the just evolution of crops, kind of cotton kind of went away from this. Uh, as, as now we, we see hemp kind of coming in. It's kind of it's kind of fun to see and kind of kind of fun to foster that new beginning, if you will. And this has been a, a great opportunity this year to to learn a lot um, because prior to you know prior to this year, uh, not a lot a lot of state had a lot of experience with it, except for a, a handful, a select handful, uh, Colorado, Kentucky, Oregon, North Carolina, and such, had been growing uh, hemp in large scale, and now it's happening here, but. I uh, I come from my dad was a what they call it a, a sharecropper. I mean that literally really? is, is how they raise their crop. Absolutely, he uh, share the crop you know share the crop with the the landowner, and kind of that's the way it's done today in large uh, in, in in a lot of operations still to this day, in lieu of cash what they call cash rent. But um, yeah, oh. so that's where I got my my beginnings. Uh, I, I moved off to Southern California for about uh, a little over two two decades where I worked in the financial markets. I was a, uh, a, a fixed income bond trader. I ran a fairly significant operation in, in Los Angeles for about 14 years and worked with a, a group of A-list actors for um, one of the private banks in, in Beverly Hills. And then something happened to me, which, you know, was just, it's just, it's health and what happens with your health. And I was lucky enough to have a, a snowboarding accident where I had broken a rib and um, I was 35 at the time. And uh, when they went to x-ray the rib and confirmed it's, it was broken, they found a, a tumor uh, on the, the very rib below it. And after doing a, um, a laser guided biopsy, they found it was um, a problem, let's call it. And I was diagnosed with a bone marrow cancer called multiple myeloma. Um, long story short, given about three years to live, I wanted to live, leave a legacy of helping others because you know, three years is not a lot. You will, you want to die my, with my first daughter um, on the way at the same time. So uh, I did three different clinical trials in hopes that we would find uh, new treatments, new processes, and new procedures that could help. And along the way, I was hit with a uh, another disease, which is about eight people in a million get it. It's, it's highly uh, wow. rare. And, and it, it attacks your platelets. Um, it's called TTP for, for the acronym of it. And it attacks your platelets, but it uh, indiscriminately attacked uh, my cancer. I hadn't been on anything in 17 years since that night that, that happened. But in that time of having cancer, of going through the treatments and the chemotherapy, I did two bone marrow transplants. That was the, uh, that was the third clinical trial I did was a procedure called a a tandem autogalous transplant, which today is is, is standard. It's, it's commonplace. It's one of the normal procedures they do uh, when uh, doing stem cell transplants. But at the time, for me, it was brand new. And, and so going through that during the second transplant, which I was in the hospital for almost, uh, well, just a touch over 60 days uh, at City of Hope in Los Angeles, I was down to about 139 pounds. And I'm six one, and oh boy, and I, I didn't look real. It didn't look real real good on me. In fact, I was I was scared I was going to not make it out of there. So I uh, I took it upon myself to bring in some assistance in the form of cannabis edibles. Um, what I made used, you decide to do that? Did you know I, about it, or just you know thought you'd give anything a try? Or no, I'll be I'll be the first to admit I've I've been a consumer since of of, oh, okay. of, of cannabis since since I was a, t a teenager. Okay, um, so you grew up in, with it. In, in lieu of alcohol, I, I come from a, a family that unfortunately has had some, some histories with alcoholism, and I chose my vice differently. And, and at the same time, I had knowledge of it, so it wasn't something new to me. Mm -hmm. I found that, uh, that the problem with, with losing or gaining your weight back when you're in the hospital is, is chemotherapy uh, kills your mucous membranes uh, that are on your um, tongue, also your, uh, you know, known as your taste buds. Mm -hmm. And so it blisters. My tongue was completely blistered. I mean, to the point of skin was would come off in my mouth, and and you know, that's what it was. But you really didn't want anything that that you know would be you know uh, harsh to them. And so 
you had to find a way to create a, a an appetite, and that's what I found it did. I, I just got some chocolates and some uh, caramels and mm-hmm. things that I could let dissolve in my mouth, and the effect was quite frank. Nurses made mention of it, and I was keeping it to myself because I was afraid of the repercussions and you know possibly being thrown out of the hospital. Right now, what year was this? I just completed my 20 year anniversary. So it would be 17 years ago in 2002. About so early, yeah, there was no cannabis legislation that had, so I, yeah, so you were nervous about it. And in the California market, it was, you know, it was still, I mean, we, we had cannabis dispensaries well before that, but it was just not something that was viewed as, as so acceptable. Okay. Uh, I found that um, it was definitely something that gave me uh, what I needed, which was uh, an appetite. It didn't cure my cancer. I'm not going to sit here and tell you that it, it cured my cancer. There's research. There's very promising research that shows it does kill cancer, but I'm not a scientist. I don't wear a white lab coat. I'm not going to go there. But that being said, I know for a fact what it did for me, and I went from 139 pounds to about 155 in a short amount of time. And, and it was kind of a, I don't know, when I eat, I eat, I eat well. And uh-huh. um, it gave me what I needed, and um, and that was that bounce, if you will. And mm-hmm. in, in the stock market, they call it a dead cat. A dead cat bounce. If you throw a, cat, a dead cat hard enough on the ground, it will bounce. <laughs> and that's kind of what my my health did. It hit the bottom wow. and, and bounced. And I was lucky enough that I had good doctors. I mean, my doctor. I wasn't going to a fly by night hospital for sure. I was at City of Hope, mm-hmm. the National Cancer Institute. My doctor was the chief. Is the chief of hematology there? He saw my uh, situation as somewhat miraculous in, the, in my recovery because this my bout went to TTP, which was a few months later after that last transplant, about seven months later after that last transplant. Uh, I haven't been on any any drug whatsoever since. Wow. So, um, wow. That's where I am. And, okay. and so my, uh, my, my getting into the industry yeah. is really kind of full circle. It's kind of full circle and it's fun because I, I have a lot of passion and you know, yeah. I, I can really tell people, I can tell people been there, done that. You know, it's I true. think, you know, the, in the people I've talked to, I think almost all of them have had some kind of experience that has brought the passion for the mm-hmm. industry. So, and you know, everybody brings something different, but uh, yeah. So you, you were kind of inspired or whatever to get into the industry or how did that happen? Just uh, things happen <laughs> for a reason. Yeah. Uh, so you, you were in financial or in um, that business, and then you had cancer, and yeah. you recovered or were in, in remission, and then you went into the hemp industry. Is that correct? Well, I moved back. I moved back uh, what I call home, which I moved okay. back to Arkansas um, about six years ago. My uh, best friend from a little town I, I, I was raised in, and I, uh, we played little league against each other. In fact, we we moved back and to get kind of out of the quote unquote rat race. Uh-huh. Um, 20 years of Southern California is enough for anybody. I love the weather. Don't get me wrong. I've got great friends there, but at the same time, the 405, you know, although it's burning up today, it's uh, it was one of those things I traveled often, and most of the time it wasn't more, more than 20 miles an hour. Um, uh, coming home was 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 good though because we got a lot of family here, a lot of friends. Mm-hmm. That's where it's you know, there's no there's nothing like it's the old saying. There's no place like home. So he and I coming back together was it was interesting because we had moved to california together it was just best friends to find find uh, new opportunities we came back he stayed a couple of years I, i've been here for several since uh, i got here but he went to a cannabis show relatively shortly after we got here about six years ago up in uh, chicago and uh, was looking to get into the industry as an investor and was uh, you know hired as a I think as a consultant to begin and then quickly became a part of the company and over a, a three or four year period became CEO of the company. He all that time was telling me, I need to get in. You need to get in. This is a business. This is a great growth model. And same time I had my day job here, which is was in large scale. Ag. I mean, that's, I, I came back and didn't go back into finance. I came back in and worked for a, a, a large rice mill. I mean, Arkansas, where I'm from, in this region, within 100 miles of here, we grow 52% of the rice in the United States. And so that's the industry I came back into. And uh, as working there, my friend kept you know, saying, we talked very frequently, and 
He's telling me the challenges, the, the rewards, and kind of everything in between about the industry. And opportunity presented itself about three years ago. And I, uh, I took the leap and it was, it was weird for the first few days. I, I pinched myself and, uh, you know, especially on social media content, I was reluctant to say, Hey, I work in the work in the weed industry. Yeah. Hey, you know, look at me because I know that's how a lot of people saw it because yeah. I wanted to, I wanted to craft a, a message. that was, you know, the right, it showed, I mean, I, I'm in it for the right reason. I, I really am. I, I want to development of the industry for first and foremost patients. Now, I'm not saying that it's not a, a plant or a consumable item that's, um, that's not, got some recreational not component. A, yeah, not applicable to a lot of, a lot more, uh, activity than just medicinal, uh, activity. But that being said, I was for the first few weeks kind of freaked out. And then at the end of the day, I, uh, I, I came to think that it's what brought me to where I am. It saved me in some ways. And, um, it's a message that I think that I, you know, God really wants me to do. I really think it's it's something that you're put in places that in your life, and sometimes it's just opportunistic. But at the same time, I think it's uh, it's that thing called luck. Now, what is luck? I think John Wooden called it when opportunity meets uh, or preparation meets opportunity. Interesting. That's a good one. Yeah, that's where yeah. I am. Oh, I love it. Yeah, really um, powerful story, though. I can't imagine having, you know, three years to live and then coming back from that, having a whole new perspective, it sounds like, on life in a lot of ways. Oh, yeah, the grass yeah. is bluer, the is bluer, for sure. So, yeah, so tell me about, um, okay, so you get into the cannabis industry, and what, did you, what was your role initially? Initially, I was hired as, a, as basically just a consultant. A consultant that really worked on technical writing for business plans and, and writing pro forma financial models. Okay. Uh, what American Cannabis, you know, who's been around about seven years, American Cannabis Company, really cut its teeth on was application writing as new markets opened after the Colorado market came into play. And so part of that application writing uh, required um, business plan, uh, technical writing, as well as pro formas and financial um, development of models so that show the sustainability when presenting, you know, to, to investors. So okay. that's kind of where I cut my teeth and it fit right into my, um, my wheelhouse was coming out of, of, out of finance and understanding um, operational and capital costs. Uh, now, it, of course, how it applied to um, indoor uh, marijuana grows or greenhouse grows, or in this case now, a, a lot of outdoor grows took me a little while to bridge that gap and understand the, the scaling, but not long. Uh, mm -hmm. because growing indoor, particularly growing indoor in some of the facilities that American cannabis is designed, developed and built, it's not like raising soybeans on our farm. <laughs> yeah. I can only imagine. Yeah. That's a learning curve. I'm sure. Uh, yeah, it kind of sounds like you were prepared, you know, you have the farming and you have the, the financial part and then you brought in kind of the cannabis connection. So it seems like it kind of meshed. Um, yeah, in my in my entire career, I've been in sales and marketing of some sort, and so I think it was a it was a perfect uh, blend of, yeah. of skill sets. So, tell me about like what you do now in terms of you said something about setting up a new markets. Um, is that from like what part of of setup are you doing? Well, American Cannabis does everything from if someone wants to come in and just have um, uh, help with their application, we'll do that. All the way to writing writing SOPs, hiring their staff, training their staff. We take operational roles, so and we take equity positions to give basically um, better diversification of capital and, and cash flow to our investors because we are a publicly traded company, and that makes it much more challenging because you've got to be um, absolutely transparent uh, in everything you do, which is, is the only way to do business. However. Sometimes you're held to a little higher standard. Um, really? And then with what happened in 2018 with the, the new farm bill. Okay. The 2018 farm bill at the beginning of this year, it transitioned my role at American Cannabis to, to the role I'm in now, which is the vice president of hemp business development. And so throughout this year, I've been working with farmers throughout the country to um, basically offer the same services we did with our, uh, our marijuana. Okay. Suite but um, but more 
more for outdoor applications than, of course, indoor. And, and but however, there are quite a few greenhouse operations that we consult with as well for camp. You know, but we've been um, involved with quite a few different states, and in these states are university pilot programs. In fact, just this morning, about two hours ago, we got uh, the release of the USDA's interim rules on hemp cultivation for 2020 crop year, which is, this is the first, this is the first uh, USDA rules we've had since, well, since 1937 when they outlawed it. Right. So, so that's pretty big. What are your thoughts on the hemp industry and the CBD industry kind of throwing shade to the medical marijuana industry in terms of perceptions, you know, um, I've heard that from other people, you know, we got the, you know, the hemp bill and the CBD market, you know, is like this great good thing. And then, you know, it's keeping the research and all that stuff that we need to get move forward on like developing more medicinal parts. Well, I'll tell you this from my experience in the CBD market, you know, hemp derived CBD, I've done some of our own studies. We're literally where we, you know, we walk out of our booth at, at the MJ Biz Conference and walk around and, and, and go into a lot of, of other booths of people that market CBD oil, whatever, you know, tinctures, salves, you know, however, uh, cartridges, however they, however they market it. And I took 13 different ones from, from the 2018 show to a third-party lab along with the COAs from each one of those, and only um, 35% had within a 10% tolerance of what their COA said. So we found there was a huge discrepancy of product that's in the market that is, um, is actual uh, what it says it is. And so when I talk to people about, and I, people ask me all the time, so what do you do? Who do you use? Whose product would you use? Right, so right. Get a, get a COA, first of all. COA. And everything, you know, that's a that's certificate of analysis. And everything that you purchase should be, uh, one of the questions I asked to them, the manufacturer is, are you, are you doing batch processing or are you doing continuous throughput? If you're doing batch processing, then you probably are doing batch testing. And so there'd be a COA for every batch. And even if it's continuous throughput, they've got to shut the machines down and clean them sometimes. So it technically does do batches. They're just much larger and much more homogenous, um, but a lot, a lot more variance in their, um, in their testing protocols and probably not as, not as accurate. And those are, I, I'm more about someone that's doing the batch processing. I think that it's, it's um, I think they're more uh, niche products. I think we have more, um, uh, more craft products and I think they're hitting their targets or, you know, everybody knows. I get this question all the time. What's the difference in hemp and, and marijuana? And mm-hmm. um, you're going to find two distinct camps out there on this one. You're going to okay. have people say, Oh, it's one's cannabis L and one of the cannabis S they're cousins They're You know, they're related. And I'm like, yeah, they, yeah they're the same. Right. News alert. They're the same plant. They've adapted to their growing conditions. Uh-huh. It's Darwinism, it's Darwinism in America. Those animals in the Galapagos Islands, they transformed over time. Plants can transform a lot quicker. And if I was to take some gorilla, gorilla glue number four, which is one of the best, you know, uh, winter or gelato last year, the, the winner of the best strain of the year, take some gelato and take a bunch of seeds of jaw. Say, take 30 seeds and plant them in a square foot. So I'm going to plant them like you're going to plant hemp for fiber, which that's the way you brought, that's called a broadcast uh, pattern. So you put, you know, a lot of seeds in a small region and they're going to grow like bamboo or cane. And so they're going to fight for the sun. They're going to fight and they're going to grow and they're going to not have any, any development of their, the side of their plant for um, trichome development, which is where the oil resides. So over time, I could develop that seed where it would lower its THC content just because it's not developing a trichome, just because of how I planted it. And so that's kind of the, the benefit of coming from a farming background. And, yeah, and huge. I studied, I studied agronomy in, in college as well. And it's a plant that it's got remarkable benefits, uh, but not just in, in medicinal qualities. I'm a proponent of, of CBD, growing hemp for CBD production. But I'm a, a much more, much larger proponent for uh, developing the the hemp and for fiber market in America, just for the other applications that are mm-hmm. construction related or safety related or apparel related. It just goes on and on, and and that's the type of 
application or growing methods that my traditional row crop farmers in my region are used to. They're not used to growing, you know, five or 10 acres, which is a, a relatively good size CBD hemp farm because of the labor intensity of, of growing it like they do today. So growing for hemp makes growing, you know, for industrial or, or you know, the, the material items makes more sense for farmers. Uh, well, you, can, you can grow a lot more, let's put it that way. There, there are dual header combines, so I can, I can grow a variety. They're called dual varieties. I can grow a variety of hemp, but at the same time, I can cut it for oil. Not for oil, excuse me, for seeds from, from the tops. And at the same time, the combine will cut the rest of the stalk for fiber. And so um, you're basically getting two different uh, crops off of, uh -huh. off of one planting. And uh, the only reason that we're not talking about fiber production any more than we are already is surely because of processing facilities. If, if any of my farmers that I consult with here in Arkansas uh, were to grow fiber this year, they'd have to haul it to Kentucky to, to get it processed. So it's just logistically in, in, you know, uh, cost ineffective. Mm -hmm. uh, that'll change. That'll change. And when it does, and what it has to happen is we have to have these facilities come in. They, they have a, a processing called a decortication. And it mm -hmm. basically takes that stalk and decorts it. And so it, it takes that the bast and the herd, which are two different types of the, of the, of the fiber in the plant, in the stalk, uh, and separates it from the other fibers. And so that they can be used in, in things like hempcrete, basically a concrete substitute um, that is quite frankly, much better than concrete. Things like, um, you know, hemp board. I mean, they're already today, they're running hemp board in Kentucky, right as we speak. They're making wow. wood out of hemp. So this isn't something that's going to take too long, I think, to develop. But regional areas that can bring in the um, economic benefit to their region through investments or, or grants, they're going to be the ones that will really benefit from this, I think, 10 years down the road. Okay, yeah. The, so the processing of it is holding up. I mean, there's enough growth, but there, you know, it's held up in certain places because there's not enough processing plants. Is that okay? absolutely, absolutely for fiber? Now for fiber, for oil, for oil, you can press it up a processing plant. I mean, albeit they're very expensive, because most of most, and that's another thing that we do is we we uh, in American cannabis we consult with people that want to put in processing operations. I mean, we call it a vertically integrated operation, a company that has the grow, and they're growing their own, their own uh, plants, they're processing them to a point of extraction, then they're doing the extraction, and then they may even be integrating along with, with retail sales. And that's, we work with a lot of companies that have all three facets of that. And, and so integrating the three different businesses into one contiguous model, ah. it's, it's a lot about product mix, um, whether they're going to make, Anything from, you know, cartridges, you know, vape pens, if you will, uh, mm -hmm. tinctures, salves, bombs, oils, capsules, caplets, um, uh, OTFs. That's kind of the, one of the new things. It's called an oral thin film, and you've probably seen them if you had the, the Listerine breath mints. Um, oh, sure. One of my, that's my favorite new, uh, um, uh, app, you know, um, uh, delivery mechanism uh, because it allows someone who's got that, they kind of, they want to stay, they want to keep that anonymity there. You know, they want to know, know someone that know that they're taking medicine. At the same time, it gives them a good ability to dose. Dosing is, is super important. And a huge uh, problem because people don't so understand it. Precisely. Yeah. It's, and that's some of the fun of this business is, is really um, still in its infancy. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of bad actors in it same time there's a lot of people in it for the right reason trying to develop uh, uh develop the industry and for the right reason that's great yeah um what's your personal vision in terms of your business and what you'd like to see where you'd like to see the market go and thoughts on that on you the u.s well industry? i'm the president of the uh, arkansas chapter of the, the, the hemp association here and um my goal is to develop just a new crop for, for, for farmers to add to the rotations. That would be huge. The key, the key with farming, farming and, and being a farmer, it, it's, we've called it legalized gambling for a long time. Okay. <laughs> and, um, uh, yeah. 
I mean, quite frankly, a lot of variables that are out of your hands. Well, you know, if you look at my peers around me, about the least amount of acreage they'll farm, and this is row crop farming, you know, this is, you know, corn, soybeans, that sort of thing, um, is about 6,000 acres. That's a lot. That's, a, that's an awful lot. In fact, the average family farm, the average farm in America is about 400 acres, I think, on average. But with uh, having that, why do they have 6,000 acres? Well, it's because it's because a combine costs four hundred fifty thousand dollars, and you have to justify the cost of it. You have to run it over enough acres to make it "quote unquote" full. Okay. And so you're going to see the same thing. Those type of farmers, though, aren't wanting to go out here and and grow twenty acres of of hemp for CBD in raised vegetable beds, so that will have a, a very intense planting regiment as well mm-hmm. as a very it's harvesting regiment as well as a very intense drying regiment. I mean, growing hemp is not nearly as easy as, as a lot of people want to make it out to be um, because there's a lot of places that you can mess up. And it's a, it, for all intents and purposes, it is a high value crop. A farmer can easily clear $10,000 an acre. An wow. acre. Now, those numbers are a lot. You'll hear a lot of people that are quoting four times that. But you could, if everything was perfect, you had the contracts and everything. But right now it's something that's, those numbers are, are one of the problems we're having is, is driving a lot of people into the market, I think, unbeknownst of the risk. And okay. And kind of going in blind. Going, okay, I'm getting a, a license. I'm going to go in and make, I'm going to make 10,000 acres. I can do this. And, and we saw it here in, in our crops in, in Arkansas, particularly, where they grow a significant amount of corn. And there's a, uh, there's a little pest out there called a corn earworm. And um, as soon as the corn was harvested, one of the last things that was left that was kind of lush in the region was a lot of these hemp fields. And if a farmer didn't have a good integrated pest management protocol, he probably lost a significant amount of his crop. I saw farmers that lost in one week 70% of their of their bud mass. To, to oh, insect. my goodness. And so, yeah, growing outdoors brings a whole new set of uh, – growing hemp outdoors brings a whole new set of risk. Uh, mm-hmm parameters that you have to, to deal with. I love growing in a greenhouse. I can use biologicals. I use basically meaning bugs to kill bugs. Uh-huh. And that's going to be as organic as possible. You know, there's some things that are happening in our in the, in the hemp business, though. It's, it's going to change this, this next year dramatically, and one of them is going to be the FDA. Talk about um, CBD and what it is and it's a consumable item. It's going into people's body. And so this, the FDA is going to see it as such. And you, know, you can expect some, uh, some pretty significant regulation in the space, I would say, in the next six months. Okay. It's going to be a game changer. That is going to make the processors that manufacture CBD products be mandated to a higher level. held to a higher standard. You're going to see them... Um, Anybody that we consult with to, to build a facility right now, we say you have to build it to ISO standards. You have to. If you don't, you're not going to be there because they're going to require things like SQF and HACCP certifications. That's a thing called uh, safe quality foods, and, and, and HACCP is, uh, is you know, hazardous analysis, critical control point. Basically, uh, it's a plan that allows that, that company that runs that business to know if, oops, if they drop some metal into their vape pen mix or something they know a, they have a recall plan that they can institute within a, a short amount of time and and identify the source of the cause root of the cause and eliminate it and stop it from happening in the future that is what's going to be a big game changer in the next six months okay that's yeah i did not know that oh that's absolutely okay and i'm, I'm liking to say there's going to be a, somewhat of a, a rats jumping off and swimming off the ship because those those folks I was referring to earlier that are making let's call it substandard material, crappy uh, stuff. Yes, ma'am. It's uh, those are the ones that are going to be uh, quick to move. I mean, the FDA has already come down on some large distributors of CBD products for making false claims. Not so much false claims, but unsubstantiated false, uh, unsubstantiated claims. It okay. may be true, but but they don't have the data to back it up. Uh huh. And the other thing I said, there's two things. There's the other thing is, is the fact that now more farmers are going to get involved because uh, the USDA have released those rules I announced this morning. I talked about mm-hmm. this morning. Uh, and those included a, a real important thing that farmers look for, which is crop insurance, because uh, it's such a high value crop. 
for instance, the seed to plant a hundred acres, the seed is about a quarter of a million dollars. Oh my goodness. Because you plant a, a feminized seed. So it gives you a high probability of having a female plant because you, you want to grow a, a female without any males in the field. Otherwise, um, you, you know, you take the risk of pollination and seeding the flower. Now, you know, I don't know, I didn't see it on your list of, of items, but one of the biggest things about, I think the CBD market that I think that is very evident is the, not just the oil market is the flower market, the CBD flower, the smokable flower market. Okay. It is, uh, it, it can't be ignored and there's pros and cons and it's grown tremendously and, and, and the growers particularly like it. They don't have to deal with a processor so much. The processor to, to use their own and extract it. Exactly. They can basically trim it, dry it, cure it, much like you would uh, medical marijuana. Mm-hmm. And and then basically it becomes a, a terpene-based uh, quality. Terpene meaning the smell, the aromatic, the flavor for someone that likes to inhale and, and smoke as well as the CBD content. Now, let's face it, the farmers get paid. And when they get paid on the, for growing hemp for CBD, they get paid on a scale that, that takes into account the, the percentage point of CBD in the plant. So yeah, that's what they get paid on. And then, of course, weight. But uh, I, I think that it's uh, a lot of things are going to change in the coming months. And yeah, yeah. I, I know that, that it's growing and it's like the Wild West, but I didn't know the detail of what is happening. So, yeah, that's really helpful. Have you encountered any kind of stigma or, you know, negative pushback in your in your work? And, you know, in Arkansas, I don't know what the legislation there is, is for medical marijuana or recreational. And you're not really in that particular industry, but I just, you know, I didn't know if it, it runs over to the hemp industry at all there's no question there's i'm smack dab in the middle of the bible belt yeah that's why i'm asking i'm like and come I, on you gotta have something on this <laughs> well I'm, I'm proud to, to, to note that we passed legislation for medical marijuana i think in 16 i think in 2016 i mean yeah in it's been, yeah we we've got we've got dispensaries we i mean you can get a oh, card good. i didn't know that yeah but you know here's here comes the problem the uh, the plan was poorly developed, poorly managed, poorly implemented. For the entire state, we only got three million people. But for the entire state, and they they allowed 32 dispensaries for the entire state of three million people. They only licensed five cultivators. Five cultivators. It's just too few. It's just Not too enough. few. And um, yeah, it, it really drove a lot of things. Our our state was the kind of the poster's child for how to do it wrong, uh, <laughs> or how not to do it. Or I guess how not to do it how not to do it and um it went as far as the state supreme court with you know fbi uh, wiretaps and all kinds of fun stuff so but but at the end of the day i'm proud to say that we were the first state technically in the bible belt to pass legislation and we were poor to implement it but they uh the prices they're charging are just out of this and they're they're ridiculous Ah. because at the end of the day for a medical marijuana program to succeed, it should be about affordable, and I say affordable medicine, affordable, accessible medicine to the patient. Okay, mm-hmm. right now our state is selling an average of seventeen dollars a gram, which is a little bit of the equivalent of a little over seven thousand dollars a pound, and uh, it's uh, you know for an ounce it's for just inside of five hundred dollars. And that's oh my goodness. That's just, that's just ridiculous. It's about half that in Massachusetts, I'd say. Yeah. And we've got some interesting markets coming online. Illinois, the Illinois market has really, has really set themselves up for, for you talking about marijuana market. It's really the recreational market that opens up in January, 2020. It's going to be a mess because they've only got 22 uh, licensed cultivation facilities. The existing med cultivation facilities are going to allow to expand. And then a few craft growers, but, that's to take care of 12.7 million people in in Chicago, which is a huge tourist destination. Ports should look like they're going to run out probably in around around May, um, and have supply issues throughout the year. Uh, and so it, it gets back to these states not managing it. I think ideally we did it very much too. When I say we, Arkansas did it very much too conservatively. 
on the opposite side of that, just to, to our west, uh, our friends in Oklahoma just did the opposite. They did it way too aggressively. I mean, there's a thing called a patient adoption rate, which is a, a state's first year or every year. It's, it's measured year over year. Patient adoption rate, which is a percentage of medical or medical card holding patients to the number of general population. And usually initial state, uh, first year state will be a little inside of a percent half a percent to three quarters of a percent and grow about a half a percent to three quarters percent for three or four years before it plateaus. And usually it goes recreational after that. Mm -hmm. Oklahoma's initial year was 4.2%. Oh, wow. (laughs) Yeah. Oklahoma, God love them. They're a uh, recreational market disguised as a medical market. I've got Uh, great friends. So everybody was busting out to get their cards. Yeah, it's it's not real hard. <laughs> it's um, in fact, I I got my card while I was in California, and I remember I got a card from a, a a doctor in Venice Beach, about two blocks off of Venice, uh, in an alley. I mean, his his office was in an alley. He wasn't in the alley itself, but he, he entered his office through an alley. He had dreadlocks and was wearing Jesus sandals and um, Birkenstocks, and, and and God love him. I got my card and and, and got access to what I needed. And so I really, I really didn't care what, what he looked like, but it was kind of funny people that stereotype and, and do that sort of thing. So uh, the, the industry is, is thankfully evolving from subculture because I think that illegitimizes a lot of it does. mainstream that needs to be, they need to embrace us. They need to embrace the fact that this plant was put here on, on earth uh, for a reason. And it's got benefits beyond our knowledge. We don't know yet because oh, yeah. CBD is just one of those three letter acronym uh, molecules that we, we still don't know that much about. We just know it does something for us. It makes us feel good. Uh, and we do know it has provides relief. But what about CBG, the mother of all cannabinoids? What about CBN? What about CBC? What about, what about those other, I think there's 115 total cannabinoids. Oh, I heard like, I hear different numbers when I talk to different people. I've heard as much as 400. And, and I'll call a little bit of uh, cock out of that and that because I went out I've heard that at a couple of trade shows and I asked for their list and they couldn't provide it. So I know that there's a documented list of 114 plus okay. 114 uh, plus yeah, So we're just at the beginning of understanding. Exactly. You're exactly right. I, I totally believe that, but documented, you know, we're getting, I mean, you know, USDA, we're getting, we're getting research money that's being thrown to institutions now to set up, Things like seed banks. Cornell's got a hemp seed bank that's being developed right now. I was ecstatic when I saw that the USDA is actually throwing money that way. I've got a friend of mine that operates an extraction facility in Murfreesboro, Tennessee. They have a doctor on staff that has got a grant that pays her. That's all she does. A grant that she's studying and the grants from the Department of Defense, the U.S. Army Department of Defense or U.S. Department of Defense rather, to study the, the benefits or the effects of CBD on cancer. And so there's a lot of things that are happening that the money is coming in. It, it's, it's what it's going to take. R and D has to happen. Yeah. Uh, and, and I'm talking about true R and D with triplicate test and blind test and everything that, that just in the way that, that, um, that, that the pharmaceutical market does it today to test these horrible things that they've made for, uh, for people. <laughs> right. And, you know, I think that's a fear is that there's a lot of people that want to use it as medicine now, not in 20 years when all these pharmaceutical formulations are finally on the market and covered by health insurance. So, you know, I think the more affordable and the more educated and like you said, accessibility is the best we can do, I guess, until it's legal federally and it can be more, like you, the, the thorough testing to collect the data. Yeah. If, if, yeah. um, if, if you're buying, you know, the best advice I can give someone if they if they ask me about purchasing some CBD products and I just say, you know, um, and I've got some, I can recommend offline to you. Um, I just don't, I don't want to do that online. No, no, I get it. I mean, and, and I'm very thorough about it. You know, there's, there's just, if someone's not willing to give you a COA, and they say, oh, uh, or we, you know, we have one, uh, or they send you one that's maybe from last year. I mean, yeah, question that. It's red flags. If there's, if there's any reason to, to doubt it, question it. Okay. That's good it's, to know. We're not to a point that we have uh, verified uh, regu- or regulations that require the verification of, of their contents. 
Yeah, and that's kind of what we're trying to do with our, our study. So thank you. Yeah, you, it was really great to talk to you. And um, I learned so much. You know, it's really about, it's about just getting information out. It's not about information so much as immense information and, and clarifying that. So uh, anything I could do to help that, you need me for future stuff, let me know. Awesome. Thanks. Yeah, have a good one. You too, hon. Bye-bye. All right, bye-bye. Thanks so much for listening to our podcast, TSC Talks. Please feel free to navigate to our website, www.tsctalks.com. Please try to support us, make a contribution, say a prayer, leave a review. Tell us you love us, you hate us, but thanks for tuning in. Stay tuned for more.